Dear Father, we invite you here to be present in our lives as we learn about Scripture, as we worship you, and as we fellowship with one another. We thank you for the blessings that you offer and the forgiveness through your Son that you provide. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
That's about 11 a month. No, 11 a week. That's a lot of churches. And if churches keep closing, then what churches are people going to go to? And out of all the churches in the United States, 65% of the churches now have either plateaued, they're not reaching new people for Jesus, or they are declining and headed toward that. 65%. That's why we have to plant churches. Because a lot of the people that will go to church in the next 25 years will go to churches that aren't even existing at this moment. And so we want to help. If you go to iplantchurches.com, you'll see a tab that says $5 individual, $10 couple, $20 family, or other. And you can go on there and you can get it set up to where with just $5, you can help start new churches. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good idea. In fact, our family supports Waypoint because we want to help plant new churches. So, if you're on your phone, I'm going to expect that you're setting up a giving gift to one of these missions, all right? Or you're looking at your Bible. I'm okay with that. But this is a chance that you can support those. If you have any questions about those, let me know. Because I want you to understand and experience what it feels like to give. And to know your money has gone somewhere and good things have happened because you've been generous with what you've been given. So giving is good. I am proud of the giving record of this church and I want to see that continue. And if you're going to continue to give, if you're going to continue to be generous, you've got to get a hold of the idea of your stuff and your money and all those kind of things. And it's hard to do that in the culture in which we live. Because I think many of us buy into, our world is bought into, a term that's called instant gratification. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It says, I've got to have what I want now. It doesn't matter if I need to save for it. I just want those things now. And so I started writing down some things that we like to have instantly, like food, right? We don't like standing lines at restaurants, and we don't want to have to cook at home. At least it shouldn't take very long. And so we've got all these food items now that we can cook in a matter of minutes. But if you're like me, I stand like this in front of the microwave. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? You know what I could be doing? It's two and a half minutes of my life that I'm wasting here cooking some food. And so we want our food uh, now. It used to be you had to wait for a whole pot of coffee to brew, right? But now we have Keurigs. And if you can do a fresh cup of coffee in less than a minute, it's like, man, this is the greatest thing ever because I want my coffee now. Uh, we've got things like Google. Man, you just ask your phone anything, and within a second and a half, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of answers to whatever your questions might be. Now, for me, one of the things that I like the most that is instant gratification for me is a DVR. Y'all got them? You know what I'm talking about, right? That's gospel truth. Because if you've got a DVR and you record your shows, you don't have to watch. Ah, oh, man, and I watch nothing live. We fast forward through those commercials, man. I don't care a thing about them. I just want to get to the show. I want to know uh, what happened. I want, I want to know if the couple's going to stay together. I want to know if they're going to afford the house that they want to buy. I just want to know that kind of stuff. I've also thought about places like Disney World, Dollywood, those amusement parks. It used to be a rite of passage that you went sometime in July, 197 degrees, and you stand in a line to ride a roller coaster. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You are sweating. You are just, oh my goodness, but it's going to be worth it because you get to say you rode that roller coaster, but now they have fast paths. And if you're willing to pay enough money, you just wave your little bracelet. And you walk in front of all them hot and sweaty people. And I'm thinking, is there anything more instant gratification than that? You can't even stand in a line at a amusement park anymore, but that's the way we want things. We want them now. How about Amazon? How about Amazon Prime? Man, you can shop from your own house, and they will deliver it for free in two days. Sometimes it will come in one day. It is the greatest thing ever because we see it, we want it now, and they bring it to our house. And to take that up a level, have y'all seen the advertisements for Carvana yet? Carvana, if you don't know about this, you can buy your car online. You shop online, you see the car you want, and they will deliver it to your house. 
And you've got seven days to decide whether or not you like it. If not, they take the car back. Is that unbelievable? But it's even better than that. In the big cities, they have Carvana vending machines. Literally, these big glass buildings, and you go and you take your token, drop it in, and your car just comes right down to you. Man, is that awesome or what? Instantly, you don't have to deal with a car salesman anymore. You can get it right now. But then one of the biggest things for me about instant gratification is photography. Because when I was growing up, we all had what was called kids' cameras. <laughs> They weren't attached to your phone. Inside of these cameras, there was something called film. And you could take 24 pictures or 36 pictures if your family was rich. And you would take these pictures at the holidays or at the ball game or whatever. You had no idea if you got a good picture or not until you went and had it developed. And then if you were like our family, most of the time you got them back, and there's about five, six good pictures. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then there's one to the fingers over the, the lens, and you're like, are you kidding me? And so you pay all this money to get maybe five good pictures. But now we have these uh, cameras on our phone. We can see what is there. And so we do the selfie, you know, or group selfie. And then we look at it, and if everybody doesn't like look right, what do we do? Take another one. We delete it, man. And there it is. No more crap shoot hoping you get a good family picture for the card. You know you can have the perfect family picture. Now, it is instantaneous. That's why we love social media. Instagram. You know how it's in that word? Instagram. You put it out there and then you know whether or not everybody approves of your outfit or not. You know whether or not if people like the vacation you took your family on, thumbs up, thumbs down, man, we like it. And so instantly we can know if we're accepted by the people around us. We are living in a world that is all about instant gratification. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And when you live in that kind of environment, it's, it's hard to think about less is more, to not stress over your finances, to give, because if I give it away, I might not have enough for myself. And I've got to have those needs met right now. But we've got to be able to look to the future. And not so much that you don't enjoy today. You can enjoy today, but you've got to think about the future. Because here's the thing. The way we view tomorrow determines how we live today. Okay, that's the bottom line that I want you to get. I want you to understand this today. And we're going to unpack it as we go along. But how you view tomorrow determines how you live today. Let me show you with me. I'm going to give you two choices. And in these two choices, you're just, you got to choose. Okay? First choice is this. I'm going to give you a million dollars cash today. If you don't like cash because you're afraid somebody will rob you in the parking lot, I'll deposit it straight into your account. Okay? So you get a million dollars today. Or, I will give you one penny today, and it will double every day for the next 30 days. Who wants a million bucks? Throw it up, loud and proud. Let's go. A million bucks? Are you kidding me right now? Come on. How many of you go, I want the million? Right? Okay. All right. Thank you for being honest. How many of you go, I'll take the penny? Okay? Some of you are smart. Let me show you why taking the penny is much better than taking the million. Throw that graphic up there, Jordan. If you take a penny and double it every day, at the end of 30 days, you'll have about $5.3 million. How many of you sold yourself short? You're like, dang, I mean, should have took the million. But you're thinking it's a million dollars today. I could be dead tomorrow, you know. You better hope not because you can't even put it in the bank today. It's Sunday, right? But if we will realize that some things are better down the road, then things can get better for us. See, how we view tomorrow determines how we live today. Jesus tells a pretty interesting story in Luke chapter 16 that I want us to look at because he's going to describe to us about future thinking and the impact it can have on our lives. So would you turn with me to Luke chapter 16? Luke chapter 16. This is an unusual story. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that now. But it's going to teach us so much if we will listen to what Jesus says. Luke chapter 16. And we're going to begin in verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. 
At his gate was a, a laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. We've got a story of two completely different men. you got one man who's rich. He's living in the lap of luxury. He gets everything that it, he wants. In fact, I believe he gets it instantly. If he wants it, he tells the servant, they bring it to him. If he wants it bad enough and he doesn't have it, a servant will travel wherever he wants him to go and bring to him the desires of his heart. He had so much food, he never wondered where his next meal was going to come from. Why? was good. But then there's this other guy. His name's Lazarus. Says that he laid outside of the rich man's house and, and he was so hungry, he just wanted what fell from the rich man's table. I don't have to have a prepared meal. You don't even have to put it on a plate. It can just be scraps. That's all I want. And he was so hungry, he was in such bad shape that he had sores on his body. And Jesus said that the dogs would come and they would lick on his sores. I mean, how sick and weak do you have to be in order to not even be able to shoo away some dogs? So you've got polar opposites of men here in this story. You've got a rich man that never wants for anything, and you've got another man who lives his life wanting. You have a man who probably never struggles at all, and you have a man who struggles just to live. Well, what happens to all of us happens to them. They die. And it says that Lazarus went to be with Abraham and to be at his side. It said, but the rich man, he went to Hades, a place of torment. He went to hell. That's where he went. Now, for us, when we look and go, hey, you're beside Abraham, what's the big deal? Not that big of a deal to us, but for Jews, it was a huge deal. Because Abraham was the embodiment of God's blessing. When people thought about Abraham, they were like, that's a guy that was close with God. And that's a guy that God blessed. And in fact, that's where all of our blessings come from. We trace it all the way back to our father, Abraham. And so for Lazarus to go there, that means he was in God's presence. He was in the best place possible. Now listen, I don't want you to get caught up in, in the details of this story because Jesus is trying to get us to just understand and think about the future. Don't worry about the chasm between them. Don't worry about being able to see from one side to the other. That's just an illustration for Jesus to drive his point in. And his point was this. What Abraham said to the man was, when he said, can, can Lazarus help me out? Can he dip his finger in water and just touch my tongue? Could, could, could he do something for me? He says, no, 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 no. Remember, when you were on earth, you had it made. You had everything that you wanted. And Lazarus suffered, but now you are in suffering, but Lazarus is being comforted. There's nothing that he can do to you now. See, how you view tomorrow determines how you live today. The rich man, all he could think about was love and life. Man, I am rich today. I got everything that I need today. It doesn't matter what people have uh, or don't have around me. I am taken care of, and that's going to drive my life. He ended up being separated from God. Lazarus, on the other hand, struggled. We don't know how long he struggled, but he's called a beggar in horrible shape. He suffered here, but then he was in God's presence. Now listen. I do not believe Jesus was saying, nor am I saying, that rich people go to hell. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is your riches can keep you from God. 
Okay, if you worship your riches, it will keep you out of God's presence. So we have to be careful. And, and, and also, don't go, I'm not rich. That's other people. Remember, us compared to the rest of the world, we are filthy rich. Okay, so just because you're rich doesn't mean you go to hell. I, I, there's going to be rich people in heaven. I have no doubt about that because of their generosity and what God does through them. But be careful, it can keep you out of heaven. And on the other side, I'm not saying if you're poor, you get a free ticket in. You're like, shoot, man, I was like, man, I'm poor, so I know I'm in. No, 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 no. Both of these, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you still have to go through Jesus Christ. That's the only way you get to heaven. That's the only way you get to God. That's the only way that relationship is restored. And so it has to go through Jesus. So rich or poor, it doesn't matter if you step through Jesus. But be careful because either one of those could separate you from God if you allow them to do so. But we want it now. I won't stop now. But you got to think about tomorrow first. So let's do this. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Would you do that? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is what Stan read to us this morning. Because this verse, I want you to see and I want you to hear. I want you to grasp this verse. Because he, Paul's going to talk to us about the future, about tomorrow, about our eternity. Now I'm going to look at it in the New Living Translation. might be a little bit different from yours, but it's okay. But look at this. Look at what Paul said. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Paul says to us, listen, your eyes cannot even see what God's done. You can hear it, but your mind cannot even conceive or comprehend what God has planned for your future. If you're in Christ. Okay. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying it, you, you oh, it's going to be hard for you to even grab hold of it because it's that good. But we get so consumed with right now, though, what I need here, the things, the stuff, and, and we forget about the future. But Paul says, listen, the future is beyond your imagination. So I want to do something this morning. I'm going to read to you from Revelation chapter 21. Don't worry about turning there. Because if you're okay with it, if you're comfortable with it, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Because Paul says we can't comprehend what God's got waiting for us, but then John is going to try to tell us what is waiting for us. So I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 21. If you are comfortable with it, would you close your eyes right now? And I just want you to listen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then an angel carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 1,400 miles in length and as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 200 feet thick. 
The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. Open your eyes. Still hard to comprehend, isn't it? That what God has prepared for us one day blows away anything here. That anything that we have here, anything that we experience here, none of it can compare to what God has waiting. You may be blessed here. You may be rich here. Every one of your dreams may come true on this earth. But even if it does, it's not going to compare. And if you struggle in life, most every day, life is difficult. No matter how hard those difficulties are, you won't remember them anymore when you step into God's presence, into what he has planned. says we can't comprehend it but John says I'm going to try to get you to because we've got to decide is there anything worth having here to give up heaven for let me ask it this way is there anything you're willing to trade here to not go to heaven when I was a kid trading was a huge thing to do we traded everything. We traded marbles. We traded playing cards, baseball, football. Sometimes we would trade toys. I loved Matchbox and Hot Wheels. And I know you're not supposed to like those together, but I like them both. And I collected all kinds of those. And here was the thing. If you got one of the latest ones, and if you were blessed enough to have gotten two, you have got some trading money. Because you could take that car and go, hey, I've got the latest whatever. And the person goes, oh, man, I'll trade you for that. And go, that's fine. It's going to cost you four cars. Four cars? Yeah, that's right. And I get to pick which cars. What are you talking about? And man, we would make those trades, and it was agony in those trades. And as I got older, it wasn't cars and marbles and things like that anymore. We started trading big stuff. I traded bikes one time. A guy that moved in our neighborhood had one of the coolest bikes I'd ever seen. And he's like, man, I don't like it that much. I'll trade you for yours. I'm like, yes. And so I had this awesome dirt bike. This thing was so cool for like five or six days until his mom made him come back and get his bike back. <laughs> like, what is this piece of junk you're riding, right? But you always wanted to make that trade to make it better. I can remember in school, do you remember this? When you brought your lunch from home, if you had a mom that packed a good lunch, you had trading power in that lunch. Because as you unbagged it, maybe you pulled out some Cheetos and a Twinkie or a Swiss cake roll. People were actually just, oh. you know, you didn't hear them. And all of a sudden, they would start going, hey, I will trade you my corn chips for your Cheetos. You're like, not going to happen. Uh, but you trade me your Cheetos, intuitive chocolate chip cookies. I'll give you whatever I've got. And you begin to barter back and forth and you begin to trade. And you always wanted to trade up and you wanted things to be better. But the problem is when we're on earth, we get inundated with all of this stuff that we've got to have. And we begin to say, you know what? I think it's worth the trade. I think the money, I think the stuff, I think the, the popularity, the, the position, the job, I think it's worth the trade. Because who knows if I'm going to make it to heaven anyway? Who knows if it's going to be as good as, as what the Bible says it's going to be? I think it might be worth the trade. I'm going to promise you this, family, it's never worth the trade. There's never anything in this life that will make it worth trading your eternity with God for. But instant gratification says it is. There's plenty. Man, get, get so enamored in stuff here. Don't worry about that. Hopefully you'll slide right in. If you don't, eh, live a good life. 
Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived or comprehended what God has prepared for those who love him. But you've got to decide. Because how you view tomorrow determines how you live today. Because if you're thinking on a heavenly level, if you're thinking about what can God use me to do in his kingdom, how can God use my things and my stuff to further his kingdom so that other people can hear the message of Jesus? Man, when you're a part of that, heaven's going to be amazing. Don't get caught up in this stuff. Maybe time for you to make changes. Maybe you need to change your priorities up. Maybe you need to let God have first place. Because I promise you, there's nothing worth, worth trading in eternity. You think if we could ask that rich guy if it was worth the trade? What do you think he'd say? Absolutely not. If we got to ask Lazarus, was it worth the difficulties? What do you think he'd say? Absolutely. View tomorrow. View more than this world. View what is waiting for those who are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. How you view tomorrow is going to determine how you live today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, thank you that you were, you were willing to trade your own son for our salvation. Thank you that you were willing to allow him to die so that we can have life. And Father, I pray that that will have such an impact on us. There's nothing worth trading for. I pray that we will look at our future and not just today. And we will let you be in control of all of it. So Father, as we go into a time of worship, speak to our hearts. May we hear the message that you have for each one of us. We love you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the fact that we've still got worship to go. We've still got some songs that we have the opportunity to sing together. And to just tell God how thankful we are for what he's done for us. To just kind of have some introspect, to look inside of ourselves and say, hey, are there things that need to change? Are there things that, that need to, to be better? Do I, do I need to, to give God more? of myself, whatever. This is an opportunity to think about that. During this time, though, we're going to have the opportunity to be around the Lord's table <coughs> to remember Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for us. So you can come to the front. There's a station in the middle. There's two on the sides. There's four across the back as well. Whatever's closest to you, you come. You take with us. You don't have to be a member of Rich Acres. If you're a believer in Jesus, we welcome you to be a part of this. We do it every week so that we never forget. It's not what we've done, but it's what Jesus did that makes us right with God. Also, during this time, you can give. We've got offering containers in the front, the back, members, regular tenders. It's your time to give. Give generously. Give so that people in India, China, Korea, and other places can hear the saving message of Jesus Christ. Yes, we don't ask you to give. Just thank you for being here. We pray that you're blessed. Also, during this time, if you have decisions to make, if you need to talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to have that relationship with God, I'd love to talk to you about that. If you need prayer, we'll pray with you privately or publicly. We have elders up front. We also have ladies that are willing to pray. If, if you, a lady, would like to pray with a lady instead of a man, you do that as well. But we want to pray and ask God to meet your needs. If you want to be a part of this church family, we just ask what the Bible does and that you're a baptized believer. If you, you are, we welcome you in our family. We'll connect to God. We're the faith of the Son. So let's take some time now in the next few minutes. Let's love God. Let's thank Him for what He did. And let's remember Jesus together.